Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Accelerating Viral Vector Commercialization Through a Suspension Platform for Greater Predictability. I'm Nicola Ambler, your host for today and editor of Facilitate Exchange, which is Facilitate's Market Intelligence Hub. Today we'll be discussing recent technical advancements in efficient viral vector manufacturing process development. Just like to say a huge thank you to both presenters for giving us your time today. Sharing experience and knowledge is extremely important for the growth of our industry. I also want to give you a quick reminder that this is an interactive session, so please do submit all your questions, they're very much encouraged. Um, use the question function on your control panel and we will address these um, at the end and if we run out of time they will be addressed afterwards. Um, I will hand straight over to your panellists, Matthew Weaver, Head of the Downstream Process Development Group and Juan Lego, Head of the Upstream Process Development Group at Wuji Advanced Therapies. Over to you. Oh. Thank you so much, Nicola, and uh, thank you everybody for attending this webinar. I am um, excited to provide information regarding the progress and obviously official launching of the suspension platform for the production of adeno-associated virus, uh, which we abbreviate for this talk as an AAV. The OXI advanced therapies um, in terms of our a specific kind of second slide that we're presenting here. We're showing here the, the Navy Yard. It's located along the Delaware River, uh, just minutes away from Center City, Philadelphia. It was founded in 1776, and in its activities as a naval, naval shipyard of the United States in the 1990s. In 2000, it started the, the, the city of Philadelphia, uh, started the redevelopment of the Navy Yard, opening the doors for more than 150 companies today an organization covering from manufacturer, R&D, and retail sectors. Interesting enough, Uxi was the very first company to break ground in the Navy Yard. And today we are proud to have three buildings uh, fully operational, as I'm going to be um, talking on the next slide. On the top left corner, the Liga One um, building uh, with about 82,000 square foot houses the cell and gene therapy manufacturing. On the top right corner, a 150,000 square foot building, uh, LI2, is a dedicated to carry late phase operations and commercial manufacturing on gene mediated cell therapies and viral vector production. In addition, uh, we have the process development laboratories as well in this building. A third building known as CC3, left bottom corner, um, shows the building where late phase and commercial operations for autologous and allogeneic operations take place. Finally, a state-of-an-art building is under construction in order to house testing for advanced therapies and standard biologics, as well as warehouse. This is a clear evidence of the growth of UCI advanced therapies. Next slide. The past progress on the viral production has happened in the past three years. A serious commitment on the development of the lengthy adherent platform took place in 2017. Thereafter, the AV suspension platform was developed during 2018 and 2019. And in parallel, activities for the development of lengthy suspension platform, which started in 20, 2019, um, just basically took place. It is expected to be completed in terms of the lengthy suspension on the 2020, um, as well as other initiatives uh, that are under development uh, for the optimization on one side of AAV suspension platform, as well as a new viral vector production suspension platform, um, which we are basically performing concurrently. Let's talk a little bit on the next slide about HEC-293 suspension adaptation. Adherent HEC-293 cells were suspension adapted by progressively reducing ABS content while translating the cells from monolayer cells into shaking platform at adequate incubation and agitations to prevent cell aggregation. The adaptation depends on the type of cell line using the appropriate media that will satisfy the nutrient needs. The removal of the ABS the risks the production of viral vectors as site contaminations such as growth factors and the toxin, 
mycoplasma viruses or prions proteins, as well as slow levels of antibodies, which are usually present on FDS. This is a major advantage. Furthermore, chemical-defined media provides reproducibility while lowering the cell culture costs. The left and the right pictures show the difference of the HEC293 prior and post-cell suspension adaptation, respectively. The cell adaptation performed in Uxi advanced therapies resulted in a successful cell adaptation in a chemical-defined media. The production and testing of the master cell bank was performed. The development of cell culture process starts with the selection of checking conditions to achieve approximately 24 hours doubling time, high viability, and minimum aggregation. Thereafter, bioreactor parameter optimization is carried out at a small scale, followed for the scale of exercise to 50 liter and 200 liter as a final production stage in cell culture in the labs or process development. The following slide um, shows pretty much is a cartoon on the left uh, that shows a triple transfection via PEI. Um, on the right figures, the testing of two serotypes are illustrated for a primary and backup cell lines. Green fluorescence protein was used as the gene of interest. Next slide. So let's start initially uh, asking us what is AAB. Um, in this case, adenovirus-associated virus, as I just mentioned, is a non-pathogenic replication-incompetent virus, originally found as a contaminant in adenovirus preparations. The AAV genome is a small, consisting of 4.7 kilobases, transcribing only A proteins with a long inverted terminal repeat at each terminal. The single-stranded DNA genome is packed into 20 nanomer, non-enveloped capsid cage comprised of the three structural proteins, BP1, BP2, and BP3, which are usually found in a ratio of 1 to 1 to 10, respectively. The other viral proteins are responsible for genome replication, encapsulation, viral transcription regulation, and site-specific integration into the host genome. As mentioned previously, AAV is replication incompetent. Therefore, it requires a helper virus, such as adenovirus or herpes virus, to successfully propagate its genome. To date, 13 different serotypes of AAB have been discovered that display differential tropism, a key attribute to their utilization in gene therapy. The next slide, just we I try to present AAB transient transfection pathway. Recombinant AAB virions can be produced via transient triple transfection, as I mentioned before, in the mammalian cell line, which in this case is HEC293. The human embryonic uh, kidney, HEC, cells were uh, originally transformed using EU1 region of adenovirus. Thus, HEC cells transfected with a helper plasmid, including the E2A and E4 proteins, provide an environment suitable for AAB replication. The red cap plasmid produces all the structural and replication proteins needed for viral production. The gene of interest plasmid, which has the gene of interest between the uh, ITR elements of AAB, facilitates the packing of the gene of interest into the assembly cap capsid. These vi the virons are released upon cellular slices and can subsequently be used for a single round infection into an appropriate target cell. When looking at the sequence alignment of the capsid amino acids, you can see a specific regions of homology between serotypes 1 through 12, indica indicated by intense blue coloring. The conservation graphic below indicates where physical chemical properties are conserved. Darker yellow corresponds to higher conservation. Therefore, while there is below 40% alignment in amino acids indicated by white, you can see high physical chemical conservation among all serotypes, represented by the dark yellow. The table to the right depicts a blast alignment of dual combinations of A, B serotypes determining, determining the percentage of homology, ranging from 99 to 53%. The variability in amino acid sequences is mainly localized in the looped out domains that are exposed to the surface of the capsid. 
which could explain the different tissue tropism. The figure at the bottom displays the biodistribution of the AAV serotypes 1 through 9 in mouse tissues. Therefore, one can start to see the advantages of utilizing the different AAV serotypes for targeted specific gene delivery. Now let's take a little bit more into exactly about the upstream process development activities. <clears throat> the <clears throat> graphic, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the graphic shows the different blocks that are considered for the development of cell culture. That's the purpose of this slide, is to show that there is an upstream strategy in place ready to be applied to different gene of interest, either for feasibility, optimization, or troubleshooting. Seed train development, let's start with that block. Providing a consistent cell doubling time, seed train might take between 14 and 17 days to inoculate a 50 liter and 200 liter bar reactor respectively. Depending on the final production scale, cells might require transitioning from shape flask to wave, followed by the steer tank single use bar reactor. Each one of these systems differs on its geometrical designs, scales, material of construction, level of instrumentation and control, mass and energy transfer, mixing and shear rates, as well as power input. Characteristics such as robust cell growth with high viability, low aggregation, and consistent doubling time are highly desirable during the seed train, independent of the cell bank. In other words, we are talking about master cell bank, research cell bank, and work cell bank. Each one of those has to be performing similarly. As part of the upstream process development, a stability studies in UCSI cells in the cell suspension adaptive cells was performed with excellent outcomes in terms of productivity and product quality, using GFP as a gene of interest. But reactor production and process optimization is a big area as well. And in this case, there are three subunits that we can just explore under this kind of block. The first one is parameters optimization. The first uh, modification of pH, DO, temperature and agitation parameters can significantly alter cellular environment cell growth, viability, nutrient uptake, metabolite production, and cell biomarkers during pre and post transient transfection are essential to be monitored. For example, lactate dehydrogenase could serve as an indirect way to determine the rigor of agitation regime that will favor initial cell growth while minimizing shear stress after the uptake of PEDNA complex. The second part is the cell culture strategy. We can refer to a very simple batch one time in operation, but also we have other strategies like media fill and fed batch, which are very commonly uh, found uh, in many of the other biotech industry. Each strategy will require the proper media formulation in order to balance the growth and productivity of for full virus particles. Media development, is one of the key points here when we do cell culture. Elimination of animal components and complex media components with significant source of variability are our first candidates to be excluded from a media formulation. Therefore, a fully chemical defined media is highly desirable. As part of OXI platform, media formulation screening was coupled to our cell line in order to guarantee consistency of the GFE production in this case for different serotypes. However, some serotypes coupled with the gene of interest might need uh, media uh, a, a optimization and screening, to, uh, as well as maybe the inclusion of different supplementation in order to guarantee the viral particle production for, a for those specific cases. When we talk about scalability, there are three big uh, portions that we have to consider. One is the scaling limiting factors. Um, Several approaches can be taken to scale up or scale down the process. Either a full or a simplified computational fluid dynamics are used to scale up. However, their complexity prohibits to be used widely. There are four scale factors, such as power per volume, tip speed, Reynolds, mass transfer coefficient, are usually common practice. Each approach will result on difference on shear stress, cell aggregation, gas dispersion, and mixing. Although its application is simple, only a single scale factor criterion can be applied at any given time during the entire cell culture process or to a specific cell culture phase. 
Furthermore, every scale will have its own restrictions. For example, comparing the two liter lab bench bar reactor to a scale production bar reactor, the buffering effects on a small scale bar reactors will pose a significant difference in cell culture fluid hydrodynamics, even though both systems offer the same level of process control. On the other hand, difference on hydrostatic pressures in large scale bar reactors results very challenging to match in lab bench bar reactors, resulting in difference of dissolved CO2. Let's talk a little bit about the operational ranges. Uh, at the bottom, um, a cell growth uh, study, if you show the, the next uh, left uh, plots there, um, a cell growth study was performed under three different power per volume settings, resulting in a perfect overlapping of the cell density. This is indicative of oxy cell line to withstand an ample shear stress range. Uh, so consequently, the bar reactor agitation can be operated under a, a very wide operational range. Even though this study is good, a starting point, different cell behavior and productivity might occur under transient transfection conditions. On the right bottom, uh, transient transfection was carried out at, at three different cell densities while keeping the DNA per cell basis contest, constant. Two and four million bubble per cell uh, per ml had similar titers uh, as an index shows as one, yet higher cell density significantly underperformed as shown in the table. Even though transfection at lower density offers an economical advantage, uh, this effect could be attributed to nutrients depletion, so a media optimization could be provided. Uh, in order to find a way to increase productivity uh, by transfecting at higher cell densities. Given the complexity of the upstream process as it was illustrated, a high throughput system would be beneficial in order to identify significant factors to optimize the cell culture process and to determine robust operational ranges that will translate on normal operating ranges later. Finally, on the right box in red, uh, I mentioned, uh, the, the, it's not mutually exclusive the development in the areas of cell line, cell culture media feeds, and plasmid sequences, as well as DNA complexing, um, in order to be having a, a thorough kind of uh, process uh, of hand. The next slide, which basically titles the cell culture profiles for 50 liter um, uh, and shape flask. Uh, in this case, um, the cell density and, bio and viability profiles are shown uh, in the left and right plots, respectively. The red curves correspond to one liter shape flask, while the light blue curves are associated to cell counts for 350 liter subs. In addition, each symbol in the graph relates to either early, mid, or late passage. For clarification purposes, the dip on the day on dates two um, in the curve corresponds to a media field. The green arrows indicates the point of transfection. Overall aggregation and metabolites were very close. That are not shown. I don't want to kind of uh, overwhelm this slide. Um, the cell viability was maintained high through the entire cell culture process, as you can see, with aggregation ranging between 10 and 25 percent, uh, irrespective of the scale at the moment of transfection. In conclusion, cell culture profiles were consistent regardless of the seed train age, passage 7, 15, and 23, and scale, demonstrating the robustness of oxy suspension cell line for AAB with GFPA as a gene of interest. The next slide is something that, uh, in order for us to proceed at a fast speed, uh, we just basically implemented, and in this case, we wanted just to kind of have uh, uh, rapid analytics in place to, uh, for us to guide all our experimentation. We employ a variety of analytical techniques to monitor the proficiency of each step through the process of the AAD production and ensuing infection. With the use of digital droplet polymerase chain reaction targeting our specific gene of interest, we are able an up to, we are able to get an absolute quant quantification of viral production. In this case, it's called GC titer. We also couple the DDPCR with the cell-based assay to capture the infection capacity of our viral vectors. 
to fully optimize our process, our analytics program goes beyond merely calculating barrel targets. Through the use of cutting edge technologies, we investigate cellular dynamics of viral production by monitoring amino acid consumption, testing various nutrient additives, and specifically regulating the transcription and translation of not only viral genes, but also host cell factors that affect our process. The next slide shows an example of uh, the, the utilization of this analytical um, instrumentation. Real-time analytics is a critical factor in providing top-of-the-line quality product. The ability to obtain data that provides insights for quick response making is, is paramount. We have developed a quantitative PCR assay that gives us same-day GC titers. The plots shown here are the GC target profiles for our AAB5 production at the shape flask and 50 liter scale. The graph on the, on the left shows the GC target profiles for 24, 48, and 72 hours post transfection for bulk materials processed through a freeze thaw lysis. The graph on the right compares our main lysis procedure versus freeze thaw, demonstrating the removal of any excess non-encapsulated viral DNA. Although this is not absolute quantification of viral production, we are able to monitor our viral pro vector production in real time. Furthermore, it was found that the productivity in the 50 liter subs for this case were higher than the one from the shift flask uh, for the production of AD5 GFP. These trends are expected as the difference between a scale is a good evidence of the benefits of having process control during the cell culture. As I mentioned previously, we also analyze our viral products via DTPCR. While this assay is more time consuming, it gives us an absolute quantification of our AAV viral vectors. The data shown here are the AAV 5 GC targets for three independent productions at the scale of 50 liter. As you can see, our GC targets remain consistently high throughout each batch which an average GC titer of A, A to E to the 10, GC per ml. This result in, in line with DDPCR titers from our shape last production. We have also seen similar absolute GC titers from different serotypes, such as our AAB6 production at the 50 liter scale, resulting on GC titers of 1.3 E to the 10 copies per ml. Therefore, we not only get consistent GC target results between batches, but also seek comparable targets between serotypes using our platform. Now, um, I'm handing it to uh, my <coughs> colleague, uh, Matt Weaver. Thank you, Juan, for passing that over. I really appreciate it. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is the downstream process development approach. So similar to Juan's slide, there's, there's four, four buckets I'm looking at here today. Uh, in addition to this, you would deal with final formulation, as well as sterile filtration. Uh, so we have the initial clarification step, and within that you have media screening. So what are the filters made out of, right? And ultimately, where do you want to go? Whether it be membrane or depth filtration? Do you want to use cellulose or do you want to use a synthetic filter? Uh, you start looking at modeling resistance and determining your sizes. For tangential flow filtration, you're focused on TMP excursion graphs and optimal concentration factors uh, for both diafiltration as well as your initial concentration. For affinity chromatography, you really want to start with small screening. Same thing with your, your polishing step. And the first thing you want to look at, all right, now I know that my molecule binds to the resins of choice. Once I know that, I really try to determine what are our dynamic binding capacities and how fast or how slow do I need to load the resin in order to achieve ultimately a manufacturable process so that my team is not loading for 24 hours, for example, through an infinity chromatography, um, but also, also what gives me a good yield, right? So sometimes if you load too quickly or loop too quickly, uh, you can have different issues. And then for the polishing step, you're gonna do something very, very similar. So you're gonna screen your media at a, at a much smaller scale. Uh, and then from there, so determine what kind of buffers you wanna use to, to start scale up. And I have some information about this in, in a few later slides. 
for this slide in particular, we're going to look at an example of TFFP in operation where we kept the feed flux constant and we really tried to focus on maintaining the TMP ranges within a, a given area based on the TFP excursions. Um, so we have a constant feed flux and you know, we optimize the pressure performance to demonstrate very good product recovery. You know, we also use the tangential flow filtration as a way to do our final formulation buffer. And what do you see on the top part here? So I think we can see my mouse. We have a loader material with recovery flush and final retentate. Uh, what we are able to determine is within this, in a given load material, we can actually produce very consistent small scale recovery, uh, where you see the overall recovery being uh, greater than 98%, well, greater than 95%. Uh, in both the, the 0 0.02 meter squared format as well as the 0 0.1 meter squared format. So the good news with this is, you know, we've at least shown this in our 50 liter scale as well, that the data that we have in our small scale unit operations uh, matches and is scalable. So, you know, if we do run into troubleshooting, uh, this becomes a lot easier because we have a small scale model that we can, we can utilize uh, with a lot less material, which means overall less costs providing the same end, end result, which is nice. So for clarification, what you're gonna talk about, there's uh, reduced sizing on a two-stage filtration. We have a, a coarse layer and a fine layer within our process. And what you can see is, you know, it's really remain constant and right around around 150 liters per meter squared, we start to get break through our first filter. The second filter held on for a little bit longer, um, but, what in order to make things a little bit easier one of the challenges you have is if you oversize your second filter uh or sorry undersize your second filter compared to your first filter you don't have to worry about different fluxes through each one of those filters so what we did instead to make it again simpler in a manufacturing environment we created the same exact uh, meter squared for each one of our layers so both the coarse layer as well as the fine layer and that allows us to run at the essentially the same flow rate through both filters which simplifies the overall process as it moves into manufacturing. In addition to that, when we do our scaling, again, just to ensure that we're not gonna have any issues, uh, if there's any, any variability with the material that's coming in, we tend to do about a 50% safety factor when we scale our, our clarification filters. Now, the good information is, is once you actually get the original data, the original breakthrough data, you can use that to model uh, the model based on time, right? So if I want to process 50 liters in a one hour time window, uh, I can actually model this off of the initial breakthrough curves. And this allows me to determine that I can, in this case, run a 50 liter batch in one hour, only utilizing a 0.5 meter squared in my clarification filter. Now, if I want to extend that out longer, I may be able to use less filter area. So it helps us with cost of goods analysis and things of that nature. Uh, but ultimately, we're focused really on how do I ensure a reasonable time, but not something so fast that manufacturing wouldn't be able to react if something went wrong. So there's a, a good balance there. And this is kind of how we, we take a look at it uh, after doing our initial breakthrough curves. So for clarification filter screening, and if you tune in the webinar that we did in October of last year, we focus on a few different things. And that is, you know, what is the highest yield? What's the maximum capacity? What gives us the lowest turbidity? But also, what's the best operationally, right? And that's that, that fourth question that not usually a lot of people think of. And as we move into our own development, and as we look at kind of the next phases and also uh, backups, right? Uh, backup filters so that we're not single source in different areas. Uh, we have our initial clarification filter, which is shown here in the very, very top of, the, of the, the table. But we also have two different filters, filter one and filter six, that showed very good uh, both recoveries, but also final turbidity as well as terminal pressures. And this is really important because if something were to happen and we were to lose our initial filter choice, you know, we would need to have a backup that we could go to. And single sourcing anything, in my opinion, is, is never a great idea. Uh, so having this backup is, is really important. And what we found was, at least from a, a standpoint of, of comparison, 
you know, as we continue to move our, our process development forward and as we look at kind of the how we're going to make things better for clients and, and again, give different options uh, if we do hit issues or if we do hit roadblocks. Uh, these are some of the data points that our team's been generating just so that we do have an additional path forwards with clients. So, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the high throughput, high throughput chromatography screening. So if you've been in the AV industry for a while, you know that there are quite a few good resins out there. However, most of those resins have extremely high binding capacities. And that creates a bit of a challenge when you start looking at how do I want to do resin screening? How do I want to ensure that I pick the right conditions? Uh, and, you know, if you start talking about, you know, one mil columns, two mil columns, you know, even in some cases the robo columns, it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. So what we're doing here is we're actually using a plate-based model. And what you see here on the right-hand side, so up in this corner, is a layout of a typical 96-12 plate. Within that 96-12 plate, you have your gaps so that you don't get interference between the two different conditions. And the hardest part with this is, is obviously it's extremely complex, right? So you're dealing with a lot of the little, little small wells, a lot of very different conditions, and different buffer preps, et cetera. Now, but there are obviously a lot of benefits to this. So within this kind of model, you really can limit the amount of resin that you would need to screen. So you're talking about microliter, 10 microliter amounts, 50 microliter amounts, versus the robo columns, which may be between two and 600 microliters. Again, not massively different. Um, but what's, what's nice about this is you can use a plate reader to get your results. Uh, it's extremely fast. And on the readout, you'll get, you know, this is a very high level version of what it might look like. Uh, but you'll get hits. And what I mean by hits is you'll have all of your blank backgrounds. So they may read an absorbance level, of, let's say 0.05. And if you start seeing things jump into, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it shows that not only did you bind the actual material, but when you eluded it, it came off into the plate. And it gives you a good idea as to what resins are actually attaching to your AAV particle. Um, from here, you can start looking at how do you want to scale up. And in my next slide, we talked a little bit about that. Within the affinity chromatography results. So what we were able to do is we could actually screen a small shaker plate, for lack of a better term, 96 volt plate, and take that information, scale it up into a reasonable size, um, show that it was efficient and actually worked as a good small scale model uh, to initially do the screening. And that led to our, our selection of choice for our resin that we ran in our current 50 liter suspension process. And this, this chromatogram here shows a, a pretty clear example of what our, our suspension process uh, looks like for a given serotype, AAB6, as uh, shown in the graph. Uh, and we know it's consistent, right? So it's a very clean graph. It shows column wash. And ultimately, our elution is a very sharp peak. And as of right now, we're not seeing anything on the back end of the chromatogram either in terms of uh, your cleaning step. We're not seeing any uh, major inflection in terms of the absorbance units showing us that we're getting really great recovery through, through those steps. Now for AEX, it gets a little bit more complicated and they're really driven around the PIs of the different serotypes. They're all extremely close together. Uh, you can use the same resin with the same buffer and, and get different results. Uh, your GOI will have an impact on this. Uh, so what, what we're showing here is, you know, from some papers, from some literature on the right-hand side, different areas and different approaches for uh, purifying AAV5 with AEX separation. Uh, now, you have this option, uh, and within our given process, after we had done the initial screening in the small shaker plates, we were able to determine kind of our best selection of resins that we wanted to look at for scaling up. Uh, now, when I say resins, it could mean resins, it could be monolith, membrane material, uh, but we're gonna generalize it right now as resins, uh, just for simplicity of talking about it. And within our 50 liter run, again, after doing these initial screens, after showing that those screens effectively translated to a small scale model uh, that we could perform experiments on, we were able to run our 50 liter run and produce something like this, which allows us to really show that we can get separation, again, from the small scale model all the way up through the large scale model, 
uh, and it really does help with that initial screening, right? So, because for us to do runs like this, and like, grant, this is a 50 meter run, but even for us to generate, you know, material like this on enough studies would take our upstream counterparts making maybe 10, 20 meters at a time. Whereas my initial screening I can do with maybe one liter, which is significantly less in terms of overall volume and just workload, uh, do those initial screens. But once we get through that, once we scale up to the 50 liter, you know, it all it all works together and produces a very uh, consistent result across all scales. Again, this is really, really important because as we talk about our AB suspension platform, right, we have this graph. Uh, this is shown with uh, GFP plasmids. However, with different GOIs, you can get different results. And if we do run into a, an issue where a client needs us to provide better, uh, better overall separation or better empty full ratios, we can then utilize our, our high throughput screening model to come up with a different solution for the client, which is, which is really, really important um, if there is a need to move from our current platform state to a, a hybrid model or a custom model for a given client. So we talk about empty and full for the final purified product. Uh, AUC results for an AV5 that we run internally as of right now. You know, you're looking around a 50-50 mixture between empties and fulls, which you can see in the AUC graph, which is located on the bottom. So you have peak one, peak two, and three, peak three. Um, so peak three, I know it may look like it's bigger, but ultimately uh, when you do the overall area under the curve, uh, you see that peak three is actually less in terms of relative percentage. For AB6, again, using a very, very similar model, uh, same process, um, we end up getting the, a full ratio of closer to 70% uh, with empties being around 30%. And this is what I was talking about before where you know, with different serotypes, you can get different results. And even using you know, the same membrane, going back to one of the original slides that Juan had presented, right, those slight differences with just how similar the capsids are between all the different serotypes, as well as those differences in PIs for each of the serotypes uh, can really cause very different results uh, within the same given process. And it's something that we know here, and it's something that we know how to troubleshoot and get around um, if we do see uh, differences or different results within our given platform. So in the middle here, just showing your empties and fulls through the TEM. Uh, the dark full circle is your, your empty and uh, the bright white circle, if you will, is your full. Um, you do see other variants within that. And in the previous slide, if you remember, I was showing, you know, you have your two clean peaks and you have this, maybe like third and fourth peak on the back end of the chromatogram. We believe those to be either different types of empties or they could be you know, damaged particles to the process. Um, we don't know that information for sure right now, but it's something that we're looking further into as we continue our development within the platform. So this is obviously the big slide, probably a lot of people are curious about. When we look at the purification yield in terms of GC titer for both AB5 and AB6, for AB5 we are around 41% recovery, uh, for AB6 we're around 20. In terms of residuals, what we know right now, you know, within our development process and within our, our large scale runs that we've performed, along with our historical database, is that the values that we're seeing within the residuals are actually very, very similar to what we've seen in past adherent results, which is very, very promising in terms of uh, the quality of the product that we're making in suspension. And at least what we're presenting here is, is as of right now, the highest results that we've seen, not to say that we won't get higher results in the future, um, but as of right now, this is the highest results that we have generated within our platform process. Uh, during other runs, we've actually produced lower. Uh, but those data is not that data is not shown. So the overall process time, again, if you're curious, it runs around 15 to 21 days, um, six days or so uh, through the bulk harvest and through the the bioreactor, and then your five days for your downstream process. Within that, we we look at our GC tether across the board. And the one that we're showing here is for for the A85. We're starting in the high E10s uh, for the bulk treated material. Uh, we start with our ABB load right around 80% recovery through the first two steps. And then you'll see over time, so you have your post-affinity results, they're at 150%. We know those values really cannot be real. 
Uh, however, um, you know, our assays are really developed more for final formulation. So when we look at our results intermediately or in process, we know that there is some variability there and uh, we take that into account. But our final bulk product is really what matters at the end of the day. And what we target in our current platform process is 1E13 VGs per mil of final bulk product, uh, which in this case uh, represented around a 41.4% yield for AV5. Now, something to note that's pretty interesting within our platform process, depending on obviously your serotype and the overall yield, the amount that you concentrate is going to vary greatly. So for A85, we ended up only concentrating around 300x through the entire process. Uh, however, for A86, we reached a concentration factor of around 2350. Uh, that complicates things a lot on the back end, specifically around your, your final formulation buffer and, and how you you work through your tangential flow filtration, uh, as well as your, your style filtration, because uh, you know you may use a very different filter depending on how much material you have to filter, right? So I know it sounds like it's redundant, but it, but it's it's a reality. And uh, these are some of the things that to consider and things that we've kind of already worked out within our, our platform process. So for logistics, I'm actually gonna hand it over to back to Juan, so we can talk a little bit more about how our platform is set up, logistically speaking here, Wushi, Wushi ATU. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I think uh, there is one important consideration here, and it's taking into consideration everything that is so intangible, everything that goes around our main kind of chain of the process. And I'm talking in terms of anything that is related to the logistics. So I basically put uh, three blocks here to show uh, part of this information. The first block on the left it comments a little bit about the reduction on time to GMP. And the reason of doing that is just because by utilizing the UXI platform, uh, we will be able to have uh, already uh, documentation such as batch records in place to have minimal or fine tuning kind of uh, things to do on it. So this matter, obviously, in a normal kind of circumstances, it can take easily a couple of months to go back and forth in terms of doing this. The next bullet uh, shows the norm in, uh, of a bill of materials. And this is quite important because obviously if you have to add critical materials lead time there, and you, you want to know sooner than later, what will be the, the, the cost that you're going to be incurring into. So having a bill of materials known from our platform basically uh, gives you a, a tremendous advantage. The third bullet is the raw materials in stock. So since we are um, basically uh, handing a platform, we are uh, aiming to have a minimum inventory in the stock. So when the client comes, we will be able to plug in their molecule and start up as soon as possible. The second big block is a uh, defined approach. So we know what we're doing here. We have done uh, plenty of studies in the process development arena. And we want just to touch bases in terms of two kind of big ways of approaching uh, the, 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 the obviously the service to the client. One way is the aggressive way, which we basically go to feasibility directly to verification and then to GMP. And the one is a more standard one where we just have a feasibility, uh, do a little for process development and basically go after that to verification to test the, the right kind of parameters and conditions that we found in PD and later passing to GMP. Now, the third big block is everything that supports all the work and effort that we do in process and that is the major analytical house. In this case, we have analytical assets in place. First, then we have a dedicated PD support from end to end. Uh, we have a standardized sampling plans and we have internally priority testing for any UXI manufacturing space. So these big three kind of blocks will help to expedite, um, to provide a fast service to our clients. Just to make a, a little bit of a, a case study here in terms of upstream, um, I try to branch out here the different possibilities when we get a client into our, into our, um, our into facilities. On the right branch, on the red, all those red blocks, uh, I'm talking about those clients that come directly with the suspension platform, with their own kind of platform. In this case, uh, we have in place in Oxy all the infrastructure to take anything related with suspension. 
And in this case, obviously, we also can provide internal service in terms of process development to kind of optimize much better all the, their own platform. On the left branch in blue, we are just basically depicting what I just call the aggressive and the standard. In terms of this, each one of those ones uh, on both sides of the branches, we will have something that is called a feasibility study, which is quite important just to know exactly what is our baseline. Thereafter, we always have that question, are we meeting the expectations, yes or no? And depending on that answer, we can go either aggressive or we can go and do a little bit of process development. Now, below, we have a tier one, which is basically three factors that we usually kind of have as, as part of our standard kind of package. But also, we can just have a, a more comprehensive way to tackle the optimization and we can have different tiers in, in terms of adding more factors that could be uh, important for not knowing, not only knowing uh, your process, uh, uh, but also just basically to have the possibility to increase your types. Now, uh, in terms of um, analytical and QC testing uh, for characterization and release, there is a full integrated platform for AAD vectors that can be basically divided in terms of vector-specific releases test, such as tighter policy assay sequencing, and also general characteristics, which are important. And in this case, we are talking about color, appearance, turbidity, osmo, purity, and obviously the most important one is just to see uh, how much of the proportion of that uh, outcome or product has a full kind of uh, uh, capsid uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a ultimate kind of quality in that, you know, in the product. Also, aggregation and capsid at ID are two major kind of things that we need to identify as general characteristics. In terms of safety, we have in place sterility, endotoxin, mycoplasma, in vitro advantageous agents, and replication competent AAD. Finally, the residuals are something that we obviously want to kind of uh, have as, as minimum as possible to ensure that we have the right purity. So we test for residual DNA, host cell protein, Benzonase and leach ligand. Overall, we can see that the, we have basically a suspension platform, both upstream and downstream from here. We have a QC analytics in place with expected limited changes and requalification due to matrix media changes that we might kind of incur. Uh, but also, the thing that we want to talk is in terms of the manufacturing, in terms of everything that has to do having the proper equipment in place. So at this point, we have 50 and 200 liter scales already to go in GMP. And we are working toward having a 500 and 1,000 liter um, totally integrated into the facility. Our next steps then are going to be to have a high producing cell lines and optimize vector. Um, accelerate the package. Obviously, as we know more, we will be able to kind of have a better way to approach a, the, 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 the client or the, the, the gene of interest in, in, in our fan. We have a, a thinking in terms of having a baculovirus system, and that is one of the things that we are going to be working uh, during this year. And we are considering ad additional platforms for, for aiming to have a, a, a drive with the cost down and, and, and improve uh, first to human. Uh, in summary, all our hard work in developing our new AAV vector suspension platform through our dedicated PD and AD teams uh, with our state of art facility is to enable cell and gene therapies to be developed, manufactured, and released faster with greater predictability. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you have any additional questions around our AAV suspension platform, please feel free to reach out to, to us or, or our BD folks. And um, we appreciate your time. Great, thank you both. Um, you've given us some, some great insight and data there. Um, we do have a few additional questions from the audience, so we'll spend the next few minutes, minutes addressing these. Um, the first question, is uh, do you typically see that separation across all serotypes? So this is Matt and downstream. The answer is no. Um, we will, we've seen it across at least two of them, uh, an AB5, which 
but you see the uh, MTM full data on the back end of the, of the presentation. Uh, that does not nearly separate as that resin. Uh, so depending on if you're coming in with an AAV5, for example, uh, if you do need to have better separation of empties and fulls uh, due to a specification you'd previously set, then we would look to do some modifications there to get you what you need for your clinical material. Thanks. Um, the second question is, um, what does the standard upstream approach in the proposal include? Um, the standard includes a feasibility study initially, just to see the base here and there, um, using our central point conditions for all the parameters. <clears throat> and thereafter, what we offer is to have a, a small process development kind of studies that we can include either a three-factor full factorial design, or we can go to an even four-factor to in a fractional factorial design kind of um, area. So uh, we can just basically modulate our study for PD uh, to be able to kind of cover as much as we can. Uh, thereafter, we just go into the verification run at a scale. Uh, in this case, it can be a 50 or a 200 liter in the PD kind of uh, lab. Great, and there's the same question to um, to Matt. What does your standard downstream standard approach include? So the standard downstream approach is really focused on once upstream is kind of locked their overall process. Um, they generate material for us at a certain scale. It allows us to focus on driving down the chromatography steps. So as I mentioned before, the chromatography is where things mostly get tricky. And we have a set way of looking at that. It's, it's up to 12 factors as of right now. And we have our standard. So we're going to run you through what our, our typical uh, downstream platform looks like. And then we ultimately have our backup, right? So within those 12 conditions, six are going to be used as our standard approach, right? And then the other six you're gonna be looking at, okay, if, if for some reason that doesn't seem like it's working for your gene of interest, uh, then we would switch to our backup version uh, to try and continue to move you through the standard approach. So that's how we, we currently look at it for downstream. That's done for both the affinity uh, as well as the, the polishing step within the chromatography. Those are the two main areas that we look like in the step that we look at in the standard proposal as those are really the two biggest high risk areas uh, to, to not succeeding, right? So we, we make sure that we lock those down uh, prior to our fixed leader verification run. Thank you. Um, we have another question here which asks, are you looking to achieve certain titers before moving to downstream development in the standard approach? Um, yes, so in all our cases study that we present through this webinar, we use uh, GFPS as a gene of interest, you know, we had, had a, a data for the AAV5, AAV6 serotypes, and we are exploring even AAV2 as well, uh, so we should have results very soon. Uh, but in terms of uh, the, 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 the titers, the titers could be tricky depending on the gene of interest, you know, there are so many factors that can impact that. So, and this is why we need to start off with the feasibility to basically then after those, getting those results, uh, see if we meet the expectations for the for for the client. Uh, it can include all, not only the the quantitation of, of of our of our product, but also if it's necessary, uh, we can go into the quality a, a, a little bit deep down. So yes, is it, it, this this approach uh, standard approach? Uh, we are looking to get uh, the maximum obviously tighter uh, out of our uh, budgets. So. Yeah, I can actually add to that question. The the big thing for downstream um, when we look at the standard approach is we kind of know where our limitations are in the downstream. And if you think about it, right, the AAV6, for example, that I showed earlier was a concentration of around 2,300 as a final concentration factor. Uh, if we're below a certain tighter in the upstream um, due to you know, losses, even 20% yield, right, if, if we think we're going to be lower than that due to absorption issues within different steps, uh, we won't be able to concentrate down to that final final dosing volume, if you will, or final volume uh, concentration, which is that 1 e 13 BGs per mil that we shoot for. So if that's the target a client is going for, that's where we we need to be at a certain tighter to, to have better 
a chance of, of succeeding there. Uh, if a client comes in and they don't really need to go to the 1E13, then there's some opportunities for discussion in terms of what title we need to start with. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is, what does your accelerated downstream approach include? So the downstream accelerated approach is, it's, it's risky. I'm not gonna lie to you about that one. Uh, it is a center point right through upstream and downstream. Uh, it only travels through uh, the polishing step. So in most cases, we're not gonna have enough material. It's, it's basically a feasibility study at a, a shake plus scale. Uh, we run it right down the middle, center point for all different all of our individual unit operations. We won't be able to do the final TFF and stellar filtration. Uh, and with that in particular, it, it's kind of a, hopefully the center point works for you and we move forward. Uh, the challenge there is if it fails, it ends up generating a lot more churn and rework. So it is a high risk, high reward though, right? So if you, if you have the high risk and it does work for you in the center point, then the opportunity to move to GMP is obviously a lot faster. Uh, so that's kind of the, the trade off there. Uh, if you if it doesn't work out though, the challenge of going back to a standard approach and realigning resources becomes a lot more complicated. Uh, so that's kind of the risk that the clients need to understand upfront uh, prior to agreeing to going after the accelerated approach. Um, next question: uh, Do you expect similar titers with different genes of interest? Um, that I would say that is very risky just to kind of say, um, uh, give like a, a precise answer there. Uh, this is why during my talk, I've been um, asking, or I've been just emphasizing that we're doing GFP as, as, a, as our gene of interest. Um, this could be case by case because the gene of interest will can have different sizes. Um, their structure also could be having an impact. Uh, so. This has to be case by case. Um, probably we need to fine tune in media, media components or cell culture parameters uh, in order for us to kind of achieve uh, the desired result. Thank you. And um, we've got one more question, uh, which uh, is, is there any possibility for having more comprehensive studies? It, it always, there is there, you know, the, the point here is that we can basically increase the number of factors out of the, the, the one that is proposed as a standard uh, to be able to have a more comprehensive study, um, if I may say. Um, and obviously this will require more time or resources. Um, however, taking, taking into consideration that we are equipped with a high throughput kind of a technology, uh, we will be able to at least provide answers in a very kind of short period of time. Um, knowing your process variability uh, and um, due to main and interaction effects uh, uh, or different factors is always good. Um, while obviously you are able to identify possible breaking points on your process. So the, the, the more studied, the more knowledge you have on your process, and that will help you just to go into the GMP with a, a much better kind of certainty of what you're going to expect out of it. Uh, we do have similar scales in PD, uh, the 50 to 100 liter scales, uh, same equipment, same controller, so uh, it's going to be kind of mirroring everything that's going to be done in the GMP. Yeah, and on the downstream side, I think that there's obviously that opportunity. Uh, the challenge just really comes down to timing. Right, so if, if you're trying to hit certain timing for clinical, you know, if you're a startup company that's trying to, you know, work with your, your investors, uh, that's where we just have to understand, you know, when we do expand out that, that development scope, that timeline obviously is gonna increase with it. So I think we, if you know, if you're looking at that as an opportunity and something that you wanna go down or a path you wanna go down, then we need to really understand what that's gonna look like to your overall delivery to clinical and, and lay out, you know, best path forward together in a, a group setting. Great, thank you. Um, that's all we have uh, time for today. Um, so I'd like to extend another huge thank you um, to you both for sharing your expertise. We've covered some, some really um, exciting and innovative developments here.
Um, and just to let you know, the webinar is also available on demand, so you can um, refer back to this uh, if you need to. Um, and on that note, I will say thanks everyone and good afternoon.